Hey there, Susie here. Before we get into today's episode, I want to share this special message with you. Now, my co-host Michelle and I love masterminds. Not only do we belong to masterminds, but we also host a mastermind. We started it almost eight years ago, and it is the premier mastermind for women business owners who want to grow their business with a specific focus on marketing. Now, this group is usually completely booked out, and very occasionally we open the doors and invite a handful of women in. So if you're growing your business, but you're struggling with feeling overwhelmed, or like you constantly have a split focus when it comes to your marketing, this could be exactly what you're looking for. We have an amazing time together and the women in the group are extraordinary. They're great cheerleaders, supporters, advisors and colleagues for you. And they're also seeing extraordinary results. We see people cracking the million dollar, two million dollar, three million dollar mark, launching new e-commerce sites that go from zero to ten thousand dollars a month in sales. They're doubling their conversion rates, they're growing memberships, they're selling courses, they're growing their personal brands, and they're getting all kinds of media exposure and speaking opportunities and so much more. You can learn more about the Mastermind and join the wait list over at herbusinessmastermind.com. We're going to open the doors soon, so you definitely want to be on the list to get an invitation. So head on over to herbusinessmastermind.com. listening to the Content Sales Podcast, a show all about how to create content to attract, convert, and keep your idle clients. Welcome to episode 181. I'm Susie Daphnis, and here with me is my co-host, Michelle Fowler. Hey, Michelle, how are you? Hi, Susie. I'm doing really, really well. How are you? I'm also doing great. Super busy, and um, but still on a high because we just recently hosted an awesome two-day event together in Sydney in person mm-hmm. for our Marketing Success Mastermind, and it was just so good to be back in person with you and back in person with our masterminders. And like I said, I'm still on a high from it. Oh, I agreed. Uh, and, and for anyone that's listening, you may be interested to know that we actually hosted this event that Susie's talking about, this mastermind in person in Sydney. We actually hosted it as a hybrid event with some attendees participating virtually via Zoom because at the time of recording, there were still a few places that were locked down or inaccessible mm. and others were present in the room. And we needed to do that, obviously, um, because of the variety of reasons that people had for being there and not being there. It was kind of a transition back to our live events. And Susie, you never know, perhaps this might be a topic of a future podcast episode, how to do a hybrid event. (laughs) Well, we learned a lot. There were definitely more Uh bells and whistles involved in doing a hybrid event. It's like, you know, if the degree of difficulty is, um, you know, a... Oh, I don't know enough sporting terms to do this properly. Let me see how I go. It was like the hybrid was a triple jump, back flip, uh, whatever the most difficult dive you can do. It was like that compared to a normal dive. And so we're great at live events, in-person events. We're great at virtual events. But the hybrid, oh, bit trickier um, because you're running two events in essence and so you've got the in-person event and the virtual event and while we are now back to in-person mastermind events this was a really good transition because we've been running virtual two-day events for our masterminders for two years now and it's fantastic to be back in person um, because there is so much that happens that's really special when we're together and now we have a hybrid event um, under our belt at that scale Mm. that, of course, you know, we can share with our listeners at some point how that works. It really is, though, something you want to approach with caution, mm. I think I would say, because, it, it, the, as you said, the degree of difficulty is way, way up there. Uh, but, you know, it definitely was magic. And speaking of in-person events, I also, I just can barely contain my excitement about this. I just find myself daydreaming about it during the day sometimes. We're getting back to, after a couple of years, the Reach Retreat in Hawaii this October. Yes, I am right there with you. I have a friend who just landed in Hawaii yesterday and was posting some photos and I was like, take me there now because uh, the Reach Retreat, I mean, I love Hawaii, but the Reach Retreat itself, it's one of the most loved and special things that we do. And the Reach Retreat is a five-day retreat in on the gorgeous big island of Hawaii and it's really a life-changing experience for all the women who come along. And it is about expanding your reach in your business and getting a plan on how you can achieve your biggest visions. 
And it's not your usual business retreat. It's really a time to pause, to reflect, to envision what you really, really want. And for many, it's a way to reinvent the future so that your business is really something that you love and that loves you back. Mm -hmm. And it's giving you the income and the impact and the lifestyle and all the things that your heart desires. And it's in a magnificent location with quite a bit of fun built in and uh, beautiful experiences with incredible other women business owners as well. Absolutely. It really is one of the highlights of the year. And people, what I love about it, Susie, is people have come back time and time again. And I just love hearing those life-changing stories from those people who came along maybe two years ago and they're seeing that experience that they had at REACH really play out Mm. over time. We've had people transform their businesses, Mm. make big life changes, buy their dream properties, experience incredible breakthroughs, not just in their businesses, but in their relationships, in their sense of what's possible. It's really pretty extraordinary. If we sound a little bit excited about the REACH retreat is because we are. (laughs) Uh, And if you're hearing this and thinking, oh, I want me a bit of that. Uh, Right now, we do have an early bird special for the REACH retreat, which is coming up in October. And so if you'd love to hang out with me, Michelle, and the amazing mentors that we bring together for the REACH program, not to mention the fabulous women who are already booked in to come, um, then you want to head over to thereachretreat.com thereachretreat.com and take advantage of that early bird bonus. And all you need to do right now to get that um, discount is to apply. There's nothing to pay at this point. You let us know that you're interested. We tee up a time for you and I to have a chat to confirm if this is the right program for you. And that's really going to depend on what your big goals are. So um, we would love to have more content sales listeners join us. So mm. once again, it's thereachretreat.com. And that early bird expires in just a couple of weeks from when this episode goes to air. So head on over there because we would love to see you. Now, Michelle, we have a really interesting topic for today, and it's all about the ways that we struggle to get specific with our marketing. Yeah, this is something that comes up a bit in some of our other episodes. We've touched on this maybe from the edges, uh, and we're really going to dig into it today. So, for example, we recently released the episode on how you need to get more boofy with your marketing, and much of that boof that we talked about in that episode is really about getting more specific rather than being very broad and general with our messaging. Mm. And of course, it's not just our messaging where we need to get specific. And so we're looking at other places as well that we need to take this idea of being more specific. It's also in our niche. And we've interviewed people on the show like the amazing Clint Salter, who focused on a specific type of business owner rather than all the business owners for his consulting practice. And while you might think he was maybe mad to give up the millions of people in the broad business owner market to focus on the few thousand in the whole world Mm. who own dance studios, which is the niche he chose to focus on, his results really speak for themselves. The minute he made that shift, the minute he got more specific, he went from struggling, feeling overworked and undercharging to being the go-to person in his industry with a multi-million dollar business. And you definitely want to check out that episode with Clint and another person, Susie, who we loved interviewing Mm -hmm. and who is proving the power of focusing on a specific niche is Shelly Brander. And when we interviewed her on the show, she talked about her multi-million dollar business focused on the knitting niche. Mm. And if you are a new listener, you haven't heard those episodes, we'll definitely be giving you links to those. And Michelle's just given you a couple of examples of getting specific with your messaging. Uh, That is what to say about what you sell and with your market. That is who you're for and who you're not for. In today's episode, we're really looking at um, three really get specific marketing strategies that can change your results overnight. Because we've noticed that there are a few key areas that we see business owners struggle to get specific when it comes to their marketing. And so message and market niche are definitely two of the big ones. But there's also strategy. We see people focusing on a bunch of different marketing strategies all at the same time and often not going deep enough or committing fully to any one of those strategies. And as a result, there's a feeling like I'm doing all the things, but I'm not getting the results. Yes. I've been thinking a lot about this. Why do we feel the need to go broad with those things versus narrow? That's a question that's just kind of going through my mind every time I see someone struggle to get specific. So for example, why do we resist focusing on one specific type of client, like those dance studio owners in Clint's case, 
And why do we feel so much more inclined to want to say we're for all the business owners, we're for all the peoples? <laughs> Uh, and why do we want to throw all the marketing strategies that you were just talking about, Susie, in the pot versus focusing on just a few? Mm. Or, you know, some of these thoughts that roll around in my head at night, why is it that we don't feel comfortable really honing our message? So it's about one super sexy hook that's going to grab people's attention and say something bold that cuts through, even if it's really just focused on one slice of what we could say about our offer versus feeling like we want to say something that speaks to all that we do and get into all the nitty gritty. And I, I do think it's a complex issue. Mm. It's as much about mindset and psychology as it is about marketing strategy. But there are three things that we wanted to talk about that are at play when we see a business owner trying to go too broad with their message and focus on trying to please those too many people mm -hmm. too much of the time and flitting from one marketing quick fix to the next. And I'm just going to give you a quick overview of those and then we can get into them a little later. But the, the three things that have kind of come through as a result of us really thinking about this issue are these. One, a fear that there just won't be enough. There won't be enough people. There won't be enough dollars. There won't be enough attention. That's number one. Two, fear of failure. What if I go all in on something and it doesn't work? And three, I hate to tell you this, but sometimes, and actually a lot of the time, it's hard before it's easy when you focus in and get specific. I hope you're ready because I know that if you are listening, it's highly likely because we know our listeners quite well that you might be doing one of these things or experiencing one of these things. And so we're really looking forward to going into each of those areas that Michelle just mentioned, fear that there won't be enough, fear of failure, and the fact that it might be hard before it's easy. We're going to go into more depth in this episode. Because when you can focus and get specific with your message, your niche and your strategy, that's when all the pieces start to line up and you can see massive changes almost overnight in the results that you're getting. So we mentioned a little earlier that we've just been at our two-day marketing success mastermind. And one of the things we love to do is choose three or four masterminders who've had some sort of breakthrough with their marketing during that previous quarter to uh, present to the whole group. Tell them about what they did, like a case study where they shared the strategies that worked, what didn't work, what the actual numbers and results were. And it's so valuable to see your peers share like that. And we know our masterminds love it and get a lot from it. And just last week, we had two of our masterminders share how that when they left that generalist broad marketing language behind, they were blown away by the results that they achieved. For example, Angela Council, who we've mentioned on the show before, she shared how she was able to 10x, 10 times her results with her Embrace program, which helps women stay healthy during menopause. Yep. She got 10 times the number of women in her program than she had in one of her earlier campaigns uh, when she had been super broad in her messaging. Now, with the support of the mastermind, she was able to up-level her hook put her own story more in the spotlight and use the specific teaching of the product launch formula that Jeff Walker, another recent guest of the show, has developed, being much more specific about who she was for and who she was not for. And she completely transformed her results and earned more than any previous campaign. And she's been running this for years. And she actually earned more than multiple previous campaigns all combined. Mm -hmm. It's awesome, isn't it? Really, really exciting. And that's that's exactly it. That story that you just told about Angela, that's really it. She got specific in all the three areas we we're talking about on today's show. More, much, much more specific with her message. She really invested the time and she stuck with it until she did get a good hook. And we know because we saw behind the scenes of her posting in the Mastermind group just how many times she had to really work on that and refine it. She also got much more specific with her strategy. She did follow the nuances of the product launch formula versus just going through the surface mm. level motions, which a lot of people do when they adopt a new strategy. They think they're doing it, but actually there's so much in the specifics. And she absolutely leaned into who her ideal client really was and spoke specifically to that person. And of course, that took some time and thought and study to get to the heart of what that woman needed to hear. And for Angela, that meant focusing to start with in her initial messaging on weight loss, 
sorry, weight loss. Now, even though that's not everything she teaches Mm -hmm. by far, that's the message her ideal client was looking for out there in the world. And so by getting specific about that early in the conversation, she was able to attract the right person and then take them on the journey to learning that that health during menopause is not just about weight loss, it's about so much more. Mm. And her results, they were chalk and cheese, as the saying goes, where she'd been working really hard to convert her prospects into clients before. In this last campaign, she actually had to close her campaign early. How good is this? Because (laughs) she had such a massive response in just a couple of days and she completely sold out her program. And Michelle, I remember the day that she opened her offer and how bowled over she was by that early response. It was so incredible. Yeah, and that's what we're talking about on today's episode. When you make these changes, those results transform. Mm. They really can transform overnight. And those are the days that you're talking about, Susie, the day we saw Angela posting in the group. I've opened my um, program and, like, I'm just bowled over. They're the days we dream about and look forward to when we're working hard um, with helping our masterminders to break through but also If you're listening, think about your own business. They're the days that you dream of as a business owner. You know, you're working hard in your business. You're putting your campaigns together. Maybe you aren't getting the results you want. You dream about the day when it all just works. Mm. And, you know, we're telling you Angela's story, but the thing is it can be like that for you too. So if you're struggling right now, you may just be one campaign away from the breakthrough that Angela had and that we've seen so many of our masterminders have when they get specific in those three areas, their message, their market, and their strategy. And I mentioned earlier there were two masterminders who shared at our program last week um, and both had this big turnaround in results after getting more specific. So the other person I want to give a shout out to is the wonderful Kat Matson, who teaches people how to speak with more confidence and more impact. And Kat took us through the way that she just got more specific with her messaging and her lead magnets, and that helped her attract the right type of people into her launch, into her promotion. And then she talked about how she then got really specific with her marketing. And instead of simply teaching a lot of stuff for free and expecting people to buy she took a different route. And as a result, she got nearly double the number of people in her program than her goal number. Like these are big breakthroughs. So awesome. And she's now got a process and the pieces in place that work. And so she can rinse and repeat over time, growing her numbers every single time. Okay. So Hopefully, we've just wet your appetite. <laughs> we've convinced you uh, that when you get specific, you get way, way, way better results. And very often, these results can change overnight. You just turn the tap on. Those people that you figure are out there ready to buy from you, they they are ready to buy from you. You're just not getting specific enough to message to them, to speak to their, to their specific issues and problems. So, we're hoping that we've got you, we've got you really keen on hearing more. And let's get back to the central idea of this episode, which is why do we struggle to get specific and how can we use these three get specific marketing strategies to change our results overnight? Now, let's dig into these three things that could potentially be holding you back from getting more specific with your message marketing strategy and exactly what you can do about it. So remember we said earlier, number one, fear that there just won't be enough. Number two, fear of failure. And number three, It's hard before it's easy. And let's look at that first one, the fear that there won't be enough. And I get it. And Susie, I know you get it, right? Mm -hmm. It's it's a counterintuitive idea in a way. Like it's like, you mean if I just serve dance studio owners versus all the business owners, I can grow my business? Even though there are millions of business owners out there and less than 50,000 dance studios in the whole wide world? That can seem like a really weird idea, but the answer to that question is yes, like a big capital letters, yes. Mm. And that's what we mentioned Clint Salter found. And uh, like Susie said, we'll include a link uh, to that interview with Clint in the show notes for today. It's really worth checking out. But he tells us in that episode, he had more money, he had more fun, he delivered more value when he played to his strengths, served the people he loved to serve and was as bold and specific as he could be about this one very specific 
niche. Mm. And even if this might be making sense to you, like in your head right now, like in theory, yeah, okay, I kind of get that. It's still possible that the next time you have to write something, and I know this because I've had to go through this process myself, um, that the next time you write something or you make a strategic decision or you think about your marketing, it's very likely you will still feel some resistance to letting go of, but I have to talk to everybody in favour of speaking to someone in particular. And, and the weird counterintuitiveness doesn't end there. Here's what happens when you can be clear and specific about your who and avoid trying to be everything to everyone. When we interviewed Shelley Brander about her knitting niche business, she said something um, on that episode, Susie, that's always stayed with me. And she said, the deeper I go into my niche. So really that's the more specific she gets, right? The mm. deeper I go into my niche, the wider the possibilities. Mm. So it's not like she's got a limitation just because she's not going for all the people who do any kind of craft, for example. Because she is specifically for knitters, she's been able to go super, super deep. And she has this incredible retail brick and mortar business. She has an amazing online membership business. She travels the world meeting people who are at the cutting edge of the knitting space. And she makes these wonderful, like, documentary kind of films as a result of and that. And at the pointy end. She's become a world leader in her space. She is someone literally tens of thousands of knitters look to for advice and to buy products from and to learn from. I love what you're saying there and this is such an important point. And I see this every single day, you know, when I'm coaching women business owners that we avoid really take on, taking on board this advice. But one person I want to call out who has taken on that advice and her business has been flourishing, uh, Michelle, is Karina Pelliconi of Plum Petal. She's one of our mm. Her Business Network members and she sells jewellery. And when I first met Karina a number of years back when she joined the network, she ha was building an e-commerce store and it was going to be jewellery, buying earrings and mostly earrings, but pretty, pretty jewellery. And what she realised um, after we had a conversation very similar to the one that you and I are having right now is that when she looked at her best customers, they were curvy women. They were women for whom the statement jewellery that she most wanted to sell were absolutely perfect. And the moment she started to get really go deeper with that niche, the possibilities did widen because then she knew what images to use. She knew exactly what product to stock in her e-commerce store. Or she knew what stories to tell. She knew what the pain points were. She knew so much more and her business has flourished. And now she has distributors all over the country distributing her earrings and other jewellery, but she has a very clear who. She has a very clear niche. And so that makes it so much easier for her. But... I can almost hear you saying, but I could make more money, Susie and Michelle, if I could just include people, if we go back to Shelley's example, who crochet and people who do needlework and people who make quilts. But the further and further out you go, the less and less specific you can be with the patterns that Shelley offers, the checklist she provides, the courses she sells, the genius tips that she shares. So I hope this is making sense. So if do you relate to that idea that there is part of your brain, and I know because my brain does, does this sometimes, that you go for the biggest part of the market because you think, oh, what if there's not enough? Am I just leaving money on the table? And it's kind of the opposite. Mm. Yeah, the irony is that actually the fast path um, to not enoughness, that, oh, there's not enough, is just trying to go so broad yes. that you – you're almost invisible in your market because you're not saying anything that's of interest or that's going to grab people's attention. So there's actually way more abundance and depth when you go specific. And I get it. I get it. This is mm. a mind bender. <laughs> it is. It messes with people's minds. But listen up. We've seen it so many times, you know, within our communities, mm. within the clients that we help, uh, and we know it to be true. And if you're feeling like, yep, I definitely do that and I have those thoughts, that's okay. You're definitely not alone. This is something that stumps a lot of people. But here's the thing. Once you're clear on your who, the clients that you serve, you can stop talking in general, high-level terms, and get into the nitty-gritty of their specific pain points and share case studies specifically like them or talk about the very real and specific results and transformations that exact person really 
really wants in their life. So, for example, at her business, we know exactly who our ideal client is, what stage she's at in business, what her mindset is, what she's struggling with, what she lays awake at night worrying about, what she really wishes could be more in her reality in her business. And I'm always attempting to speak to that. It also helps me to see who we're not for. And originally, years ago, when we were the Australian Business Women's Network, we were for all women in business. And part of it was, oh, you know what you do is so great. It would be so good if you did this for women in corporate and women who were just starting a business or had an idea for a business. Or, or And I thought, yeah, that's more people. And so we were trying to be all things to all people, whether you were a career, had a career, corporate, business owners. Or, but over time, we refined that. So we no longer cater for women in corporate or on a career path. We're specifically for women who own their own business. And while we do get women join who are new to business or have a side hustle and we can help them, our sweet spot is women who have been in business for a while and while they're getting some sales, they're hitting roadblocks. And those roadblocks are around their marketing. They're about managing their money and having reliable revenue. They're around building a team or putting systems in place or managing their mindset or grappling with the technology, for example. That's why now you will notice all our products, all our services, all our programs, all our promotions are geared around that woman. For example, um, we know that getting new clients is a big pain for her, whether she's a solopreneur trying to grow a more sustainable business, whether she has a team that she now has to um, provide salaries for, or whether she's scaling a big business, it all starts with her getting more clients, making more sales, which is... um, why we run the Get New Clients Coaching Week. And another thing we know is that if she's our ideal, ideal client, she's knocking on the door of that six-figure business. And maybe she's even been there for a while, but she wants to go towards seven figures. And that's why we have a program called The Road to a Six and Seven Figure Business. So we're speaking very specifically to the aspirations, the wants of our ideal client. The other reason that it really is important to mark your territory as far as who you're for is it's easier to get referrals. It's easier for people to think about someone who needs what you do if they know what you do. For example, dance studio owners, going back to our Clint example, they can refer their friends and colleagues from other dance studios in different geographic areas. And um, I've told this story before on the podcast, but I'll tell it again. I remember being at a conference and we were sitting over a networking lunch and I asked the gentleman next to me, what do you do? And he said, I create websites for doctors. I could immediately give him a referral. Had he just said, I do websites, I would have thought, well, that's nice, but a person wouldn't have come to mind. His ideal client would not have come to mind like it did that day when he said specifically, I do websites for doctors. It is so fascinating, isn't it? And and we're kind of going down this line of discussion because this this first big awareness around getting specific with our marketing strategies is this underlying fear that we may have, whether it's conscious or not, that there isn't enough, that we have to have all the things and appeal to all the people and say all the words. And that sense of lack and scarcity Um, can cause us to think, oh, I'm just going to spread my net so wide so I can bring more people into my world. And actually, this episode and any other time you'll listen to us talk about it, Mm -hmm. we want to say that's a fallacy. In most cases, that is a fallacy. And it is something we need to rewire our marketing brains around. Mm. It's such, such an important step to really getting those different results. Uh, Bonnie Christine, who is an artist we've had here on the show, now she specifically serves people who want to learn surface pattern design. So that is creating designs that might appear on wallpaper or cushions or mugs. That is who she is specifically for. And we have an episode with her uh, that we're going to link to. She just recently had... Um, her she launched her annual program and she had her biggest um, results ever. And this is a woman who already kicks butt majorly, but she had her biggest year ever because she's gotten more and more specific about who her ideal client is. And um, we could give you countless examples. The mm. deeper, the more niche, the more results. Yeah, and so less can definitely be more. Um, And just on that 
train of thought, just some more examples, like um, Lorraine Dalmere is somebody that I know from Formula Botanica, and she serves, she's got really specific, she serves people who want to learn how to make face creams and oils and things like that from scratch that are really, you know, natural and don't have any of the nasties in them. Um, a friend of mine, Will Hamilton, is focused on the tennis niche but each product so you might think well tennis that's a niche well that's a real that's still really broad he makes each product super specific so for example here he has a product how to play doubles with a new partner so it's not just how to play doubles it's when you are in that specific situation where you've got a new partner or he doubles down specifically on how to improve your serve and we have a podcast episode with him because, you know, we've got a podcast episode with just about <laughs> everybody. Great guests. <laughs> <laughs> Another person that's been on the show is um, the awesome Dylan Frost. And, you know, maybe success leaves clues here because look at all these amazing people that have been on the show. They all have this ability. They've made this mind shift to get specific. He goes narrow and deep. He only helps people who want to sell products on Amazon. He doesn't do other platforms. He doesn't branch out from other ty- in, into other types of how you might sell products in other places. It's all very narrowly around Amazon. So less can definitely, definitely be more. And when it comes to your market and who you serve, the more specific you can be, the better your results in most cases. So that's the first sort of strategy that we want you to start embracing around Letting go of this need to feel like I, I, I'm not going to have enough. If I go narrow, I'm going to miss out. And to rewire your brain around, no, narrow could actually be mm. more abundant. So, Susie, I thought, why don't, do you feel good about moving into the second reason? Absolutely. Let's do it. Okay. So the other reason you might be struggling to get specific, and we know that when you can get specific, you can change results overnight, is this one. And and this one can be a little personal and we all have had it at different times. I'm going to put my hand up in a big way to say I have this. And it can be around the fear of failure. And really nobody wants to fail. You know, we live in a culture where um, failing is sometimes celebrated. And I think we're seeing that a little more, but mostly it's still something to be avoided at all costs. You don't want to get a fail in your exam. You don't want your you know, your campaign to fail. It's something kind of to be avoided. And um, I love something that Jonathan Field said. And Jonathan Fields is someone you should check out. We haven't had him on the show, but Susie, you've interviewed him. I have. I've interviewed him. He's a wonderful author. He's got a fantastic podcast. And he's more, I would say, in the personal development space, mm. would you say? I would. I would. He's got uh, – he does a great um, – he has a process called Sparkotypes, which is mm. kind of how you can find that um, f- sort of way of approaching the world or the things that you want to really do that um, allow you to live your spark. He's uh, talked a lot about failure. He's talked a lot about um, some really, really awesome topics. And I love reading his email uh, mm. newsletter and reading his books. And the thing that he said about failure, um, he said, Um, he was talking about getting more specific with his focus area in his business. And uh, I just thought this was so relevant. Um, And he was looking at both who he served, so which is something we've been talking about on the show already, and what he delivered. Uh, And he said there can be this intense desire to avoid the potential pain of failure. And as a result of getting specific, he said this, There can be a fear of choosing the wrong one thing and having to endure the pain of starting over. And I just thought he put his finger right on it. And I totally get that. This getting specific thing that we're talking about can feel like we're saying, hey, take all your chips, everything you've ever worked for and put them on red seven (laughs) and maybe you'll get lucky. Uh, But you know, there are a lot of numbers and on that roulette wheel and you know that, oh, when I think about it like that, the odds are probably against me and that's how it can feel. But that's not what we're saying. Conversely, you might be thinking, well, wouldn't it be better if I took all my chips and spread them out on every number on the roulette wheel? But then even when you win, you don't win because you've stretched all your resources so thin. And it's this idea that if I double down, I'm risking more failure, that if I pick one thing, what if it doesn't work? And I remember, I don't know anything about um, horse racing. 
um, but I remember quite a few years ago, I got invited to uh, the Darwin Cup, I think it was called, up in the Northern Territory of Australia. And um, it's the only time I've ever been to a horse race. And I decided I would just put a little bit on every horse in the race, Susie, which actually was not a very good strategy because even though I be, guarantee- right? You're bound to win. You would. <laughs> you would. You'd think, okay. Uh, I mean, maybe if like the thousand to one horse had won, not that I know anything about what I'm talking about here, but um, even though I thought I guaranteed that one of the horses I backed would win, I actually lost money because I put a little here, a little there, and I hadn't really taken the time to study or be strategic. So I had spread my risk, mm. but actually I didn't realise I was making the biggest risk of all of not getting specific and focusing. And so my winnings ended up being less than the incredibly wide outlay that I'd made. <laughs> That's fascinating. <laughs> and the thing is when we do spread ourselves too thin, hoping to cover every base, get every client, not leave anything on the table um, and not fail, not lose, guess what? We're likely increasing the chances that we will lose, that we will end up short. Now, we do not want to gamble with our business and we're not saying that choosing any random niche or any old person is your, as your ideal client. There needs to be strategic thinking about it. So where is the hungry crowd for the solution you offer? And there kind of needs to be a crowd. And do they have the resources to buy what you're selling? Do they know that they need it or want it? And we could go into a whole conversation about creating products and services that people actually need rather than what we think is a good idea, but that might be another episode. Can you reach them in a cost-effective way? These are all questions you need to answer. And it may be that you have the breadth, a breadth of customers right now because you've been taking any work that comes your way for fear that there won't be enough if you don't. And this is okay. If you're doing this, it's okay. We don't want to make you wrong. It's really okay. But when you look at that cross-section of customers, who are the ones that you love to work with? Who are they, and likely it's the same ones, who pay well and who refer the, their colleagues and they say yes when you make them an offer. If so, you've got the makings of your more specific niche right there in those people, those people who are already showing up to be gold as far as customers go. So you want to ask yourself what some of the common characteristics of those ideal clients are. For Clint Salter, that's how it happened. When you listen to that episode, you'll hear him tell the story of how he was working with all kinds of business owners and he had a few dance studio owners in the mix because he used to be a dance studio owner himself. Now, they were the ones that he loved to help and he had a particular mastery for that type of business because he'd been one and he felt very passionate about it. And guess what? They loved him and they were referring their friends to him and getting results and staying his customer for longer. So it's common that clear and niche will emerge when you start to look at what's really working, what's really lighting me up, who can afford me, um, who is getting the results that I'm trying to produce. And now is the exact right moment to look for that more specific customer in the sea of customers that you might have right now uh, or that pool of customers if it doesn't feel like a sea. There's still <laughs> going to be some that really jump out. Um, so we have looked, Michelle, at a couple of reasons why you might struggle to get specific. We looked at that fear that there won't be enough customers, enough interest, enough to say, to sell and so on. And we've looked at this fear of failure. What if I pick the wrong thing to focus on and it fails and I have to start again? We want to now look at that third reason that Michelle outlined earlier, and that is the idea that it can be hard before it's easy. And what that means is that just trying to be everything to everyone is the path of least resistance, but it actually asks less of us in terms of our strategic thinking and in terms of the research we need to do or the depth we need to go into for our messaging and our products. It seems like it's the easy way. Yeah, that's so right, I think. You know, for all the reasons we've discussed so far and more, um, reorienting your business so you are for a specific who or spending more time at the start of your campaign, really dialing in your message and making it super specific and boofy, which is something we've talked about in that earlier episode you definitely want to check out, or going deep as a dedicated student to really learn and understand the specifics of a marketing strategy. Uh, we ain't going to lie to you. That's harder than just speaking in general terms, Absolutely. just kind of taking what's on the top of your head and thinking, well, I'll just say, you know, um, something really broad um, and picking out some sort of surface level understanding and tacking them together. But, and this is a really big but um, that 
we're hoping you'll just trust us on <laughs> and wrap your head around this if you if you haven't already. And you may already be thinking along these lines, and this may just be confirmation for you. For you. The hard part is front-loaded. So what do I mean by that? Once you can crack that specific who and that specific message and you do dedicate yourself to really doubling down on a few specific strategies, getting to that specific nuance, that is where the fortunes are made. Um, like it's, This is where you will really make a massive difference. So it's hard, but then guess what happens? It gets a whole lot easier. You gain momentum. You start getting results and you can build on those results. You break through because now you actually have something meaningful to say in your emails and social posts and videos and campaigns. And it's landing for your specific customer and your product, that thing that took you ages to crack and figure out and maybe you did do a few things that failed or weren't quite it and you tweaked and refined them is now the exact thing that your ideal customer has been looking for. And because you have more of your ideal customers, you learn even more about their issues and their pain points and their language and then your messaging gets even more powerful and then you get even more clients and you can see how you can end up in this really cool upward cycle. Mm. And I know when it is feeling hard, it can be easy to switch back and mm. take your eye off the prize. But we saw it with Angela. We saw it with Kat. The more that they zoned in on getting through the hard bit, finding that right messaging, trialing that different headline, trying that different, all those different things, the breakthrough was there. But it was hard in the beginning. It was hard. It was mm -hmm. like, I've done this program so many times. Why am I not getting the sort of numbers that I want? Um that's exactly the journey that we've seen them take over the last couple of months. They immersed themselves, however, in a strategy and they committed to it. So Angela said she'd read Jeff Walker's book, Launch, multiple times and treated it like her manual during her promotion. So she followed the product launch formula to the T. She read it and reread it and implemented. She put the time in to one specific strategy. She didn't try and do everything and mm -hmm. she got the results. So she made several posts in our Mastermind Facebook group about it, getting feedback from all of us on her hook and making it more specific. And it was hard. She was three weeks out from her launch and she realized based on feedback um, and also on her continued understanding of the nuances of the strategy she was implementing, that she had made some foundational mistakes. So she then scrapped everything and started again three weeks out. That is hard. That is a tough decision to make. But remember, it's hard before it's easy. The easy part followed. She got a flood of sales the moment she opened up her promotion. In fact, she had people begging to take her money before, take their money, before she even opened up for sale. And that was just based on the pre-launch marketing that she had done. So the promotional work she'd done before she was even um, taking sales. And she closed off her promotion early so she didn't have to do days and days of extra work and extra emails. She was done. She was able to close up early and turn her attention to supporting the people who had said yes to her Embrace program. And her clients were thrilled. I just want to hear Angela's story over and over. It is such a good one. I just love it. And such a great example of what we're talking about. She did the hard yards and she didn't give up. She stuck with it. And then it became easy. Now she's had this breakthrough. She's got this idea of something that she can rinse and repeat and she knows that it's going to work. So it really is, I think, a lot when I look at this process that I've had to go through or that I guess we're all continually going through in terms of um, this particular conundrum, it's really about standing in the tension. All the stuff we've talked about, at first it's going to feel counterintuitive, like you're missing out and like there won't be enough. Just know that and stand in that tension. Keep moving forward. Keep committing to this idea of how can I get more specific. And even when you do feel that fear of failure, what if I've chosen the wrong thing to focus on? Maybe I'll just quickly add everyone back in. Resist that urge. We've all felt it. Just stand in the tension of, no, I'm doubling down on this. Do the work and dig into the strategy. Don't just half bake it. When we second guess ourselves, when we get halfway down the road and we 
think, oh, hang on, I'm going to balk at this and I'm going to just throw 50 more things into the mix just at the end. We are often snatching defeat from the jaws of victory. So, so try and avoid half-baking it or bringing other things in at the last minute out of fear of failure or fear there won't be enough. Really study the strategy you plan to use. Angela, in addition to pouring over Jeff Walker's book, went and signed up for every launch, everybody following his product launch formula that she could find. And she watched carefully what they were doing and when and how they were doing it, what they were saying. She made notes. She became a student of the specificity. She looked at the specifics. But you know what? It all paid off. And now she's on this road to mastery. She's only going to go from strength to strength to strength, as we hope that you will too. And it starts with acknowledging why that we do struggle with specificity, but then committing to do it mm. anyway, getting specific with our message, our market, and our strategy, the specific problem that we solve, and specifically then how that problem leads to the next problem you can solve. And if I can go back to something Jonathan Field said earlier, um, further to that comment, that, that quote that I shared, I also really resonated when he said, what I do know is that I'm beginning to feel like it's time for me to reel in the nets a bit. I love that. I'm getting increasingly dissatisfied with being known as someone who's pretty good at a whole bunch of things. And I'm yearning more and more to be known as the X guy, the one everyone turns to for that thing. Maybe not for life. I'm quite certain X will evolve into Y and then Z over a period of years or decades, but I'm needing, I'm feeling the need to explore and master one at a time, even if it means leaving certain activities on the table, risking choosing the wrong one and having to correct. Sequential, uh, this is my favorite bit, sequential is starting to replace simultaneous as my mantra. Oh my gosh, I love that. Mm. Good. With a brain that has so many things going on at any time. <laughs> that is music uh, to my ears. Sequential is starting to replace simultaneous. I love that quote from Jonathan because it can feel like you're sacrificing all the other ideas and all the other people that you want to help, but that doesn't need to be forever. When you mix things up, when you cobble together a bunch of disparate strategies and have a message that wanders all over the place, not clearly for one uh, anyone in particular and trying to speak to everyone, that you run the risk of falling flat. And I really do understand it because we're trying to get results. We're trying to get them quickly. Time is passing. But you need to get specific with what you're doing now in this campaign for this customer with this message and this strategy. And so embrace that idea of Jonathan's of needing to do everything simultaneously and don't. See it more sequentially. Schedule that other thing for those other people <laughs> later. <laughs> don't try and be all the things to all the people all at once. Even just as an experiment, I promise you the results will surprise you because we want you to succeed. We want to see you win. And when you get more specific, you have more chance of winning. So remember, struggling with specificity is normal. It can be counterintuitive. You may feel fear that there's not going to be enough or you might be picking the wrong thing or it may feel hard or awkward to start, but just try it. And do let us know how you go with it. We are so keen to hear from you. You can contact us over at our Facebook page. If you just search for Content Sales Podcast, you will find us and message us and we are right there to answer your questions and hear your comments. Another way that we love to hear from you is when you leave a rating or review for the show on Apple Podcasts. So if you enjoy this episode, share it with a friend and head on over to Apple Podcasts and leave a rating or review. We have over 95 star reviews right now and I want to thank you for listening. There's one particular person I would like to call out and that is Katrina from Camino Shoes, which are designed in Australia but made in Italy, Michelle, um, and they're pretty gorgeous. And she sent a message on Instagram. She said, love your podcast, listening to the newsletter one right now. 
And Katrina was referring to the episode we did on the seven most common newsletter mistakes and how to fix them, which was episode 177. If you missed that one, we'll pop a link to that in our show notes as well. So we've mentioned a few different resources here on the show, a few different past episodes, some of the great guests that we've had. So we're going to put links to all of that over on our show notes page, which you will find at herbusiness.com forward slash get specific, herbusiness.com forward slash get specific. Michelle, what a great episode, if I do say so myself. (laughs) (laughs) This is a topic near and so dear to our hearts because we do know we've seen the light switch on, the changes happen overnight. I mean, and I know we've talked about this in various ways in other episodes, but it just felt like let's embrace this head on in this Mm. show. So I'm glad we did it. So we'd love to hear how you go. Do message us over on the Content Cells page. Now, Michelle, what do we have coming up in the next episode? In the next episode, we're really looking at how you can go from um, providing one-to-one offers. So they're the things like services. Let's say you're a naturopath and you work with clients one-to-one or you're a lawyer or a counsellor or a consultant and you work with one client at a time. And in those cases, you're pretty much, in most cases, trading time for money. You know, if you stop seeing clients one-to-one, then the income tap turns off. And so in the next show, we're going to talk about how you can move from or add to those one-to-one offers what's called a one-to-many offer, which as the name suggests, you make something once and you get to sell it to many people. And this can include a live or a virtual event where you present to tens, hundreds, or even thousands of people, or an online course that you might deliver to multiple people, really anything where you leverage what you're doing to serve more than one person at a time. And it is not to be missed. This is a great one and a real game changer for your business. The, the exact words I was going to say, it's a game stra- changing strategy that we have seen women inside of our mastermind, inside the Her Business Network use to leverage themselves so that you're no longer exchanging time for money working one-on-one. You have important information, you have incredible knowledge. And so this is about looking at some ways that you can get it out to more people without having to work harder. So that is coming up two weeks from now. If you don't already subscribe to the show, hit that subscribe button wherever you're listening. Um, to make sure that you get the next episode. That is our show for today. Michelle, anything you want to say before we go? I was just thinking about how exhausting it can be throwing those nets so wide. Mm. I was just imagining there's, you know, somebody out there throwing a net. You've got to throw it so, so far. And that takes so much energy and time. And I'm, I'm just still meditating on Jonathan Phil's words when he said, I'm beginning to feel like it's time to for me to reel in the nets a bit. Mm. And uh, I just, I'm going to take that away as well and meditate on it some more um, because when we do that, it's less energy, but very likely more return. Mm. Just imagine this in my head. I have this picture of the net actually dissolving into the ocean and then I have a fishing line. <laughs> Catching a mega fish. <laughs> Thank Love you so it. much for listening. We'll see you next time on the Content Sales Podcast. Bye for now. <laughs>